time for some Type 40, extra Type 40 video exclusive content with me, Dan Hadley, Birmingham's King of the Geeks. Welcome back to the channel. Yes, here we are talking all things, all things Doctor Who, scrolling the view screen for the sights and sounds of the Hooniverse, those fixed and not so fixed points. Who's calling this time? Who's calling this time? Who isn't? <laughs> Fortunately for me, it's a couple of sensible voices with trained ears. I've got Charlotte and Sarah both here, and we're going to talk about something very, very specific. Are we on this uh, on this mini edition of the show? Very, very mysterious. We're going to be talking about a slice of Doctor Who audio drama doctor who is rife with audio drama now there's probably more doctor who that exists in audio than even just on video and that's just the official stuff let alone the unofficial stuff and it could be from anywhere in the series history as well but most of it goes out now under this familiar blue diamond logo the old new logo or the new old logo however you want to look at it but where we're going this time yeah we're going to be conjuring up all sorts of memories because it's very much the time when this was rife. This was the site across all of the BBC branding. It was on billboards. It was on the official Doctor Who website. So that silver DW back to back forming the shape of the police box with a blinking light on the top. Just seeing this takes me takes me back there, Charlotte. 2010, 2011. Oh, seeing this seeing this brings me back to my happy my happy spot <laughs> because yeah. it's Matt Sarah. <laughs> and if people know me by now, they know I adore the 11th Doctor. And I, I've always thought that's a really clever logo, to be fair. It's not too fancy, but it just quite sleekly, I think, has the idea of sci-fi and Doctor Who and the TARDIS. Oh it's, a, oh, it's a brilliant design. Yeah, it's so simple, but yeah, so clever. Really, yeah, I think it is my favourite. It favorite transports you back, doesn't it? It transports you back like it a weeping angel. It sucks you back in time. Yeah. But this isn't something that's official BBC that we're going to be talking about. It's actually the work of, of these guys. This is Vocal Lab. This is their logo, which is even simpler. But obviously those are, those are sound bars going up and down. Mm -hmm. This is a production house that specialises in, in audio drama, uh, sci-fi fantasy storytelling, mostly set around, around Doctor Who. But I understand, Charlotte, you're quite familiar with Audio Lab, aren't you? Or at least Miles? When the show's not on and when it's a bit quiet, the fans are always doing something with audio, like you said at the beginning. And um, one of the actors in this, Miles T Taylor, he has his own YouTube channel. And for the last, I think, three or four years, he's been doing his own Doctor Who audio where he's the Doctor. That is, is his oh. original creation. It's not him oh, wow. being another Doctor. Yeah. It's his Doctor. So I, I know I've listened to Miles for a couple of years and what I've always really enjoyed about him, I say this with love because he's an actual actor. Like a lot of the fan stuff is fans, and like you can tell the difference between a fan having fun with their mates, yeah, mm -hmm. or somebody who's an actual actor. Miles is, and I think that shows pretty much with all the stuff he has ever done. So yeah, I knew Miles from his own. So it's nice to see him pop up actually in something else. It's something different. So this is Vocal Lab Productions. They describe themselves as a non-profit group who specialise in the creation of fan audio dramas. So in this instance, they go back to this specific time and this relationship between the Doctor and Amy Pond. Now, obviously, Amy first appeared in 2010 in the 11th hour and stayed on the show for about two and a half years. And during that entire time, it was very much a time in the show's history that was uh, had a kind of fairy tale picture book feel to it, mm -hmm. and the the lives of these two characters were kind of intertwined in a way that is particular to Stephen Moffat. It's very chopped up, very timey wimey, and and very emotional as well. So those characters mm -hmm. they felt very wrapped up in one another, almost like almost like they were siblings. And so when eventually, as always happens in Doctor Who, said when they've got a part company. Mm -hmm. it, there's, there's that wrench, isn't there? There's always a, a wrench of, of yeah. some kind, really. If, it, if yeah. the characters aren't, don't feel it so much, then the audience certainly do. But when it came to the Doctor and Amy, obviously because he first met her when she was very, very young, I, I often think that Amy was on the show for longer than she actually was. It, it does feel, yeah, because we saw her grow. We saw her, you know, first as this little girl, 
And then, you know, we got young Amy, we saw her get married, we saw her be- become a mum. So we met the family, you know, lovely Brian. And yeah, it's the imaginary friend element. It got that so, so right. So we got that childlike because Matt's doctor is so much like a child, you know, that curiosity. What I loved about Amy is she, she never really lost that little that vulnerable side to her. She was always kind of a little girl, you know, and we'd, you know, it'd reappear in certain episodes like in um, The God Complex and, and episodes like that. It's just a really interesting dynamic that we'd never had before. Amy was so important to Matt's doctor and he sort of said, this was, your face was the first face this one saw, that sort yeah. of, it, he was so fresh from his regeneration. Mm-hmm such an informative bit of him as well just sort of regenerated and having those sort of just that one night with her i think almost imprinted them on each other it feels really lovely doesn't it now the blurb for this audio drama it's a 30 minute audio drama from vocal lab productions it says so here we are me and you time and space the next page exclamation mark 12 years ago their story ended now the story continues It's very, very simple. So uh, rather than us talk about it too much beforehand, let's have a look and a listen back in time to the the trailer to this new audio drama. From Vocalab Productions, Doctor Who, Short Trips, Ex Libris. In all my adventures in time and space, I never get time to read. I collect books like I collect friends, untold stories, and unlimited possibilities gathering dust. Wait, what's this? An ex libris, a book plate. I've never seen this before. These markings embedded into the art itself. It looks like a QR code. Let's see when this book was published. 1941. But then that must mean... Amy. Doctor, I hope this works. It's been a while since that afterward, and I couldn't leave you like that. Rory suggested to try embedding something in these book plates. So here we are. Me. And you. Time and space. The next page. Mm. Just hearing that music and their voices, and and I know it's not <laughs> Matt and Karen, but how good are the how good are those voices? Fantastic! Yeah, that music. Oh, oh God, it stirs so much. Short trips, ex libris. It's written by Thomas Beach. It stars Miles Taylor as the Doctor and Oriana Rose as Amy Pond. Pond, as he calls her several times during this, which I'd forgotten the whole Pond thing, Charlotte. How could I forget that? that, And what I love so much about this is you can tell whoever wrote this absolutely adored the era. Because like Mm. you said, there's so many little references. The Pond, the sort of... The mannerisms of Matt's Doctor, Mm -hmm. the sort of how he would almost he wouldn't move smoothly like you can picture when he's speaking his sort of <laughs> flailing arms yes. and the sort of the little ticks yeah. that Matt's mm-hmm. doctor had and I think and also the the fact that this so effortlessly I think does pick up from their final episode with with mm-hmm. the books and how this literally just feel like Moffitt's just come back to write an extra half an hour just to cap off sort of these characters. This is ground that Doctor Who goes back to at its peril, doesn't it? When things are all wrapped up relatively neatly and nicely, we saw last year, Sarah, on the TV show, how they went back to the Doctor and Donna and touched something and and sort of fiddled with something, which was kind of left in a similar place, which I think that, let's put it this way, results definitely varied. There's a lot of people that didn't didn't please that they were going back there at all, and the, and mm-hmm. the results it, it really was quite divisive. So, despite this being an unofficial production, I think anybody going back there risks sort of uh, disturbing the furniture, don't they? I mean, what do you think about what Charlotte's just said and, and about this this production? 
Yeah, it is. Um, when I read the blurb, I did kind of a oof moment. How you know this is a fan production? How delicately are they going to handle this? Because that, that was a good. How dare they? Oh uh, well, yeah. <laughs> oh no, it was. It wasn't that extreme. Yeah. yeah. But no, no. I, I was honestly, I was very pleasantly surprised, as Charlotte said. Everybody involved in this, uh, Thomas the writer, clearly loved this era. There's a lot of love. And affection, uh, respect, um, and and I love how they tied it to. Can you remember um, during lockdown when there was that little little skit they did where you first yeah, mentioned Anthony Arthur. and uh, um, Arthur did a little oh, yes, diary on a yeah. video, basically being Rory, which was quite well done. And so that was already set up about them adopting, and you know, and this letter to Brian. So they've effortlessly weaved that in as well um and i think they've done it in such a way where you know you can take it or leave it i think it works really well it sounds like definitely something that amy and rory would do um and, and just even the humor the little bits where amy would talk and then she go and rory says this and rory says that and Rory doesn't want to be a grocery buy anymore. He wants some gold. Can you leave us some gold? It's actually something that I was laughing. I was like, that is what I could imagine, you know, Arthur Darvel suddenly popping his head like he used to, and he'd say something. And they'd have Just this around report. the door frame or something yeah. like that. And they'd always be this, because they were such a brilliant couple. Um, so, yeah, a lot of affection that, um, you know, they've got the books in there and the. The idea of the book plate being like a, a QR code in that, that is so Moffat, you know, the timey wimey yeah. thing. And even the title, you know, it makes me think of, you know, like extremists or something. It's also a very Moffaty title. I just think, wow, you it's just a really, very, you love yeah. this era. It, it's a very pretentious title, but then it's again, a pretentious it belongs bit. to that era. But it fits that, yeah. Well, also, what I love for all, like you said, the sort of timey wiminess and the pretentiousness with the title, like, very much I agree with you, that's a Moffat thing. I think that's why it's called that. At the heart of this, it's actually quite emotional, and it's actually very much this idea of Matt's doctor not being able to let go of Amy. And I think if you think about how sort of harshly she got taken from him, like, other companions got to say goodbye, even Rose. Yes. got to have that moment on the beach like they all have had to have their peace almost mm. whereas amy got one sentence at most to say mm. goodbye to 11 and then she went it does my head in sometimes when doctors are written mopey and a bit sort of sad for no reason but i think actually if any doctor's got a reason to want to reconnect with their companion even if they know it's not the best idea i think it would actually be 11. i can see him being like this, wanting that final bit of contact with Amy and being very reluctant at the end to let it go. Because I... the, pre the premise, because the premise of it is quite simple, isn't it, Charlotte? So Amy has become a novelist, a writer of pulp fiction back in the in the forties, mm -hmm. and she in in each of her books she's embedding little messages to the Doctor here and there at various junctions throughout her life for him to track and to read. And to uh, and to take in to sort of like to, to keep track of her life afterwards, almost to put him at peace. It's as if she anticipates how he may be feeling. Mm -hmm. But what I like about this, well, it, and it didn't hit me really until after I'd listened to it, and, and it had, it had really sat with me for a good hour or so, was the symmetry to it when we first meet Amy Pond. You know, we we meet Amy when the Doctor meets her, and we mm -hmm. see her kind of fixate on this character who's in her life for that one night yeah. the raggedy man and then he vanishes and she over the time in between i can't remember how many years it is between young amy meeting him and him meeting her again as a as a grown woman but it's quite a length of time but she embellishes so much into him she mythologizes and obsesses over him and draws pictures of him and he becomes almost an idea 
doesn't he? In, mm -hmm. in her head. And she the, the change is shape that she tries to keep some sort of grasp on because it meant something to her at the time. Mm -hmm. And she wants to keep it close to her for as long as she could before letting it go. Here, I think what they, what they do with this, what Thomas Beach, the writer, has done very, very cleverly is to invert that. And so mm -hmm. it's Amy, just as you sh said, Charlotte, it's Amy that's left the Doctor's life in literally the blink of an eye. And so he kind of, as much as the Doctor ever can, he sort of hangs on to her. I won't say clings on, but he does hang on to her. And by her reaching out, and she anticipates that. And so she gives, gives him a bit of herself because she exists just as an idea, doesn't she? The, the situation has reversed. And the Doctor is kind of fixating on her and tracking her life afterwards and, and, and following her, uh, to her to her fate, I suppose you could say. Yeah, and it's very much at the end when I'm not going to lie. I had to stop watching this new. I like I had to yeah. stop my first what listen through for the last with about five minutes to go when it was that last message when she was older because mm -hmm. I could feel myself welling up the way older like she's probably in her eighties. I get the impression or like very very old at that point. The last message, and it's her basically saying. I know you've 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 not moved on from me, and I need to be the one to do it. I need to almost be the one to cut the cord here, mm -hmm. and she doesn't want to. And it's acted brilliantly, and you can hear that reluctance, but you can hear she knows it's the better thing to do for him. And it's sort of the pain of having a loved one and knowing you that you have to let you have to walk away because that's the kindest thing. It's cruel in the moment, but it's kindest mm -hmm. overall. And I think that's what it's portraying in that moment. And it's so, like I said, I could, I'm getting like choked up. Now you can just feel, I I feel myself. I did. <laughs> yeah, I had it when, um, uh, when we first meet uh, Anthony and Amy's confiding, you scared of fears of becoming a parent. And, that, and I was like, you know, has Thomas got children? Is he a father himself? Because of the the stuff that he was saying, Dan, I'm sure it must have mm. resonated with you. All these parent so. fears and what do I do? Am I going to be a good parent? How do I, you know, bring this child up in the world? And the doctor's advice, um, just really powerful stuff. And uh, yeah, the um, and what Charlotte was saying about, you know, cutting the cord, it reminded me very much of, did you ever read or watch P.S. I Love You? Oh, yes, yes. I, yeah, I read the book. That is the one with Gerard Butler. Yeah, and he, he yeah. writes, doesn't he? He writes them letters one a month. And it, again, it's to get, get her back, um, back to live, you know, by the end of the year, right? I've forgotten about know. that, yeah. Um, and that's really what he brought to him. But obviously in a lovely, timey-wimey way. I mean, the... What's fantastic is this is just two actors, three at the end, reading letters. It is such a simple premise, but it just feels fantastic because of the level of the because the performances, think, the level of emotion in there. I think this is this is what we're what we're seeing here is the medium used so perfectly, yes, intimately. It's an intimate story. We receive it intimately through through our through our ears, there's only two or three voices, as you said. It feels very, very intimate, but also very authentic. And to an era that was really quite big, you know, Doctor Who was quite big and showy during this time, and yet it feels very, very small, very, very intimate and, and, and authentic. It also feels strangely and cosily analogue. The clicking of the typewriter the entire time, for example. Like, yeah. You know, he's, nobody's communicating by by a smartphone you don't hear the quill on the parchment you don't hear any of those kind of cliches you could argue a typewriter is a cliche but it's right for the time because mm -hmm. it's tactile and it's obviously speaks of that era like the pulp fiction stories detective mm -hmm. stories that kind of thing so all that really really works it's a shorthand we, we can pick up the pace to all the time and, and all those production values are blended so perfectly to support the two performances i mean i i'll be honest with you at no point during this am I convinced that I'm listening to Matt Smith and Karen Gillan. But there's no doubt in my mind I'm, I'm listening to the 11th Doctor and Amy Pond. Mm. I think there, I think there is yeah. a difference. I think, it's, I think it's judged and delivered just right. So I never feel like I'm listening to a comic turn. Nothing feels too exaggerated. I think it's no. just right. 
Yeah, and, and I think what did impress me, and I think this is hard because I've heard quite a few people try and do the 11th Doctor at this point. I think Miles actually gets one thing really key, and I think that's what... I agree with you. No point do you think, oh, this is Matt. But I, it's yeah. so close because I think he's got the in the sort of the rhythm of how the eleventh yes. doctor speaks, and that's he such picks a hard up, he picks thing. Up the torch. Mm. He picks up that torch and go and goes with it. Because Matt had a very deliberate way of speaking as his doctor that changed dependent on his emotion, but he had like a base sort of rhythm, and it's such a hard thing to do because it was so unique to Matt as a performer. And it's that sort of, I think all performers have their individual things they bring and it's hard to mimic that. Mm -hmm. But I just think with the the way he would say pond, it was very like, yeah, that's the sort of way Matt would say that. <laughs> yeah, the, the key phrases and yeah, the the tempo as well. I think Miles does a really, really good job when the 11th Doctor's talking fast. Again, he's got that rhythm. Um, but he's it got just enough emphasis. Because I noticed he doesn't do the lisp, does he? I no. don't really pick up on that. But it, again, you, you didn't need because again, it's not a it's I not a carbon have, copy tried of, to. Uh, exactly. And if he'd have tried to do that, you he wouldn't have been able to help but exaggerate it because yeah. that's the natural way that Matt Smith talks. Mm -hmm. And to try and ape that, you would end up you'd have to exaggerate it. And then it then it would turn into more of a parody because you just yeah. yeah. To be honest, and I think almost Matt suffered a bit that from that himself by his third series in moments. And I adore, but even I could admit, yeah, at points he was almost over comic, mm. sort of this sort of overdone mm. version of his self. And I think I don't know what you felt. I think there's the the key thing you do have to get with Matt if you're doing him is the age. Like that's the one thing you need to mm. nail. And I think he did very well in, in this, <laughs> Miles. I, I was very impressed with how Amy, the actress who plays Amy, had, you know, got her aged voice. Because right? she isn't she isn't Amy, you know, as we particularly remember her. She, you can already tell that it's, it is a couple of years on. And increasingly, as the years go on, I think there's really, she's a really good talent of, you know, getting that across. Um, I mean, we, we obviously we've we have heard Karen do that. You know, in the girl who waited, she got a chance to, you know, play around with that and be an older Amy. But you know, we've never had an elderly Amy to that point. And that the way that you know, her voice starts breaking. Did you notice know? as well, Sarah, how she got her Scots accent got broader as she got older as well? Yes, I did. I thought that was a nice touch. Just because, because, yeah, just enough, again, enough that it didn't become parody. There were points during Ex Libris where I felt that the slick production was perhaps a little too much. I felt there were some places where there was kind of too much music, where it would have actually been more effective to hear the voices against next to dead silence. But that's really the only criticism. Because this is a full half hour. I think if it had been 15, 20 minutes, it would be different. But it's a full half hour. I think you, you can afford the quieter moments then. But that really is my only criticism of what made for a really enjoyable listen. A nice balance of pathos and levity that took me back to a time in the series that I think I'd forgotten how much I loved. Mm -hmm. It's made me want to go back and rewatch the episodes now. <laughs> it really has. <laughs> me too. Me too. And and as uh, as dedicated Matt Smith era fan, Charlotte. And speaking to what we were, we were talking about early, earlier on, I felt that this absolutely closed the circle unequivocally, didn't it? But I like how Thomas Beach resisted any need to write anything to make it end in a cosier kind yes. of way somehow it resists resists altering it adding to it or taking anything away it, it just adds that little that little crease yeah I, I think like i said before it just realistically sort of t thought of how would the doctor be feeling after amy's mm. sudden departure like how would that affect him and we know and then matt's doctor was very good at hiding his feelings so it was commenting on that. And like we said, Amy wouldn't want to leave 11 sort of 
being not wanted not knowing what to do with himself mm-hmm. so i agree with you it very much it it concentrated on what the characters would be at, at this certain point in their lives and it just concentrated on that it didn't think i'm going to add more story like you said he didn't do what Russell did, which I thought was terrible in the specials, which was let's have a happy ending when it was quite tragic. He, he sort of kept that tone of it's still sad. It's still a goodbye. But it's like you said, it's them being able to say their peace to each other and then sort of go, I still adore you, but I need to move on. And I think that's actually a really good message to put out there to, to basically say, it's enjoy healthy, the it? life you have and enjoy your friends and family, but don't hang on to them to the detriment of yourself. Because it, because obviously it has to end where the snowman picks off, where he's, you know, he's sulking oh, in yeah, his, yeah. on his cloud in the TARDIS, um, you know, clearly struggling because there's a lovely, I think it's a, in one of her letters, Amy's saying she not, I was so proud of you for, you know, going to me as a little girl and giving that little girl hope, even though you're feeling, you know, you're dying inside and you're struggling. You, you did that for her, but now you've gone back and you, you've clothed yourself and, you know, you're not going on adventures. You've lied about everything you've done. You've just been sat in the TARDIS reading. And the fact, you know, that she, she knows him well enough that he's done that. And that, you know, he's got to live his life again. It was so powerful. And I also think that's why the grandson sort of had his piece said at the end of this as well to sort of say, I never met you, but I grew up with stories of you and how important they were to me growing up and me wanting to be a journalist, which is also another lovely little hat tip to Sarah Jane. She's even mentioned here. Oh, I, I had a friend that was a journalist. So it's all these things, like you said, Sarah, of what the Doctor is to the fans. I think this talks to that as well a lot, this audio, and what, how much the qualities of the Doctor mean to us as fans, and we appreciate and love that about him. Is it a recommend? Definitely. Oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, yeah. it is for me as well. Big thumbs up. Yeah. All, all three of us, undoubtedly, I say, it's put a smile on my face. Yeah. It, it really did add it just a bit... Just a bit of magic, I think, to my day. I had it on my headphones while I was while I was walking around the park, and yeah, it was it was lovely. It was a, a pleasure to listen to, and that half an hour, it, it went it went pretty pretty quickly. So this yeah. is Doctor Who, Ex Libris, Short Trips, Ex Libris by Thomas Beach. It stars Miles Taylor and Oriana Rose as the Doctor and Amy Pond. You can find this on YouTube on the YouTube channel. The link will be in the description. And yeah, go go over there and, and comment and tell them that Type 40 sent you by all means. So this is Vocal Lab Productions. And they, they it seems like they put out quite a lot of Doctor Who stories uh, featuring one character or another. So have you heard any of any of them, Charlotte, or is it just Miles' other stuff? I, I'd seen them suggested. I hadn't listened to them. But I'd seen, because th- those covers are so well done as well. So yeah, I'd beautiful. seen the covers and I'd seen them suggested because I'd listened to them but no, I've, I knew Miles but I hadn't heard their work so I'll definitely I think now listen to the, their other Doctor Who stuff Go and seek them out, there's a lot of really talented and dedicated people putting out fan made audio at the moment, uh, some of it is better than others as mm-hmm. uh, as is always the case with any creative endeavour but I was really really impressed by this, it's like oh, this vocal lab they're clearly for real I'm absolutely going to go and, and see what else they've got on offer Sarah Oh yeah, me too. Yeah, God, the, you know these covers are incredible. They're so beautiful, and uh, yeah, I think very impressed. And yeah, I will definitely be <laughs> be watching more. <laughs> Three new fans here for the efforts of Vocal Lab Productions, thanks to their brand new Doctor Who Eleventh Doctor release, Ex Libris. Yeah, you can find the link to that in the description. Let us know what you think. In the comments section, Type 40 Extra is our after show, but it's also a before show and in between show to everything else that we do here at Type 40, whether it's podcasts or live streams, videos, basically any other silliness you could possibly care to name. We'll be popping up on some of that, doubtless, in the next few days. So keep an eye on the channel. Let us know what you think. Maybe you heard Ex Libris before us. 
it's quite likely it's doing very very well and deservedly so so all our best to vocal lab productions to miles and to oriana and to the writer thomas beach too thank you for inviting us to review it i think this shows if you've got an idea just go for it really just go for it because audio is just such a freeing format for you just to go wild so just heart's content do whatever you want i think it's brilliant I there can't add to that. She said everything for us. <laughs> well done, yeah, Charlotte. Charlotte, say, Charlotte says go wild. So, yeah, just go wild. And uh, if anybody asks you, why have you done this? Say, blame Charlotte. <laughs> <laughs> Let us know what you think in the comments. We'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.